Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, you turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. The Gospel of Mark chapter 10. Uh, while you're turning there, we'll uh, remind you to always pray for us as we seek the Lord's will. Uh, that uh, we would preach what would be pleasing to Him. The Gospel of Mark chapter 10, we're going to begin reading in verse 17. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, the Bible says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, and kneeled to him, and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And when Jesus, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou likest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. Now shall have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. I'd like to preach the Lord be my helper this morning on the thought, it's all or nothing. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, we thank you for the mercy that you show New Testament Baptist Church. Lord, we pray that you would give us a craving on the inside to be in your will. Lord, that you give us a hunger to follow your uh, pathway for our lives. Lord, that you would cause us to be glad in the things of the Lord. Lord, that we would thrill at the preaching of your word. Lord God, help the seeds that have been planted according to your mercy and grace, we pray it. Amen. Now, uh, here we see some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. I sometimes think that we miss, uh, miss the uh, boat on what the Lord is uh, giving us to look at. But at any rate, you see it preached on very, very frequently. Now, I want to make two distinctions before we begin. Number one is your cross, and number two is the Lord's cross. Now, the cross of Calvary in of itself is not to be worshipped. It's not to be idolized. It's not to look, be looked at as a good luck charm. And many, <clears throat> excuse me, many so-called churches today look at it as some kind of something, some kind of idol to be worshipped. And that comes from Constantine the Great and, and the Catholic religion. Uh, it is not the image of the cross but it's what was accomplished at the cross. And your cross is much, much different than that. It is not the cross of Calvary. Your cross is specific to you as the cross of Calvary uh, was specific to Christ. Amen. And verse 17 says, And when he was gone forth into the way. Now two things there I want you to see. Number one, Christ was always willing to get into the way. Whatever God had for him, he would pray and he would put himself in the exact place that Christ would have him to be. Into the way. Now many times he, he spent some all-nighters in prayer getting his flesh in a condition to get in the way, whatever it was, into the way to, uh, to appoint the apostles, into the way to walk on the sea, into the way to, uh, to succumb himself to Calvary. He was always praying to get into the way. Now we'll see that it seems insignificant here, but he had an, an appointment to meet with this man right here, and to make the appointment he had to get into the way. So if the Lord gives you a leading somewhere, my suggestion to you is to get into the way, let yourself cross paths with that individual, get where he would have you to be. And when he was going forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. 
Now, this individual seems very sincere, and, and I've never really seen this occur in my own uh, ministry. I've never seen anybody come and run to the preaching. Have you? I've never seen anybody slam the door of their car and just run to the house of God. You don't see that. People, you know, gather their things together and look around and, and shut the door and check the locks and, and, and meander down to the house of God. And this man came running. Now, there was one other individual like this, and I wondered if anybody could name him. It was the maniac of Gadara. He came running to Christ. So, I want you to see that not necessarily just because you're prompt to the house of God, does that make you an individual that loves God, because we see this man really what his... His goal was, was a sense of self-preservation. And that's what we have today. It's not interested in spiritual things. What the interest in is, is the preserving of this flesh. Well, we often think of being cast alive into hell, and it is a miserable thought, but our, our grief is not from being separated from God. Our grief is for this flesh burning everlasting to everlasting. That's the real grief. And that's the, if that's the only thing that draws you to Christ, I dare say you're probably still lost. And so we see then uh, this individual uh, comes running to the feet of Jesus. It looks good. It probably impressed others. He falls himself down in front of the Lord Jesus and says, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And I can answer his question, nothing. Right. Nothing. And the Lord was using him as a point of illustration. And he used these events to show him exactly where, his, uh, where he was. And he missed the boat. He never got it. And I want you to see, really, he did the, he, he did the same thing with Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him by night and said, Oh, good master. Called him the exact same thing, right? He says, Good master. And he says, he must be born again, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus had no idea what he was talking about. Nicodemus, it, it was like foreign language to him. So just the fact that he came is really unimpressive. <clears throat> and the fact that he had an interest in eternal life. Even that, in and of itself, is not very impressive. Verse 18, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Good answer. You know, what's the answer to that question? You know, the Lord said nothing uh, out of the thin air. The Lord Jesus said nothing by happenstance. And the reason that the answer to this question is this. He was buttering Christ up. The reason, why, why do you call me good? He was buttering him up. He was saying, you know, I, you know, I know you're good. <laughs> and I'm good too. You see what I'm saying? I, I know you got the plan, but I have a plan too. He, he was getting him up because you know what? He really did not love Christ. He really didn't. And, and so we see then that this individual comes with all these accolades for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ sees right through him. And this morning, if you are a fake, listen to me, if you are a fake, he sees right through you too. He sees right through you. And so he says, What cost thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Now, he seems to be saying that he's a regular mortal here. And I've had a lot of people take that out of context. But who was Christ? Was he not the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ? So he, he was saying, I'm the only one that's good. You're not good. Nothing about you good. You're depraved. You fell with Adam. There's nothing about you good. And so he was trying to say, and the reason why if he could have called Christ good in the right way, you know what? He would have been a born again individual. The only way that we can call Christ good and know who he is and sense who his goodness and his greatness is is to be born again. 
That's the only way that we can really understand the goodness and greatness of our God. And the reason He was called Him good was to see what He could get out of it. To see, to see whom that He might could impress. To see what He could do for it. Then He answers and continues to answer and says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, is that all the commandments? No. Those are the six behavioral commandments, right? Mm -hmm. The four commandments in reference to God are left out. Now, why do you suppose he did that? Because he didn't always do that. Remember, to one, he reduced it down to two things. Love God and love man. And so it wasn't that he didn't know about these commandments. It wasn't that he, you know, uh, uh, the, the very first commandment was to honor God above all things. And, and so we find that he did, it wasn't that he didn't know about them. But he did know this. He knew that man was focusing on fleshly things. So he give them, he give them the fleshly portion of the law. He give that young man more or less what he wanted to hear. And sometimes I think, you know, if you're in a if you're in a service and you're not centered in on the things of God, what I have found in my personal life, and I don't think that I'm much different than anybody else, is that I hear what I want to hear when what we really need is to hear what God wants us to hear and hear it in the way that God presents it. So he see, he gives him the behavioral commandments. Notice what he says. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I've observed from my, from my youth. Now, is that true? Absolutely not. Because the Bible says concerning the law, the Lord Jesus Christ in His own ministry says, if you've done it in your heart, you've done it already. And because of the carnality of this flesh, if we be honest, most of us have committed adultery in our heart. <laughs> and the rest of us have committed murder yeah. in our heart. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Amen. So, he adds insult to injury in lying to God. And God was, uh, Christ was the God-man. And so he was lying to God. And we're horrified at the very thought of that. But how many of us on a routine base lie to God? Oh, everything's alright with me. And listen, you know what? It's not just salvation that makes everything alright with God. You can be walking at a guilty distance. You could have abject sin, plain sin in your life. And you know what? Whether you come to the same conclusion or not, not everything is right with God. When we have open sin in our own lives, it's not right with God. And I'll go a step further along those lines when we have secret sin in our life as well that only you know about, your life is still not right. It's still not right with God. And, and so we see that this young man was very evil in the fact that he lied to Christ. He lied to himself. He was not in the way that he should be. And then notice verse 21. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him. Now, I want you to see that Christ loved him. Now, that's hard for me to understand. But I will say this. Christ came the first time as a lamb. And he'll come back as a lion. Christ, God the Father, the great God Jehovah, Elohim. He is that section of God that is righteous. And, and he will devour you in a moment because of sin. Now, you, here he presents himself as the humble lamb. Now, did he love him into to saving? No. Did he love him into salvation? No. Did he shed his blood for him? No. You say, oh, how can that be? 
Well, lost person, listen to me. Did you have good fresh air to breathe this morning? He loves you. Did you have something to put in your gut this morning? He loves you. Did, did, did you make it safely down here to the church building? He loves you. He might not love you to everlasting salvation, but just the grace and mercy of life. Listen, He loves you. Amen. And he, he, he loved this man in the sense that he, that, that he gave him life. But he also loved him enough. Have you ever had anybody love you enough to tell you what's wrong? That's what he was fixing to do. Now, my mother could be a master at it. And she loved me dearly. But she would tell me when I was messing up. And if you have good parents, they do the same thing for you too. That's love. May not be the kind of love we always want to hear. May not be the kind of love we always want to feel. That's the wrong with parent. That's what's wrong with parenting today. You know what? When you have a rebellious child, the worst thing you can do is, Joey, that's fine. You keep being a rebel. That's not love. All you're doing there is validating sin. That's all. That's all you're doing. And, and so we see that the Lord did love him, and he loved him enough to, to show him what was wrong with him. And so he continues, he says, uh, One thing thou lackest, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor. Now you can't take up your cross carrying the world. Now, there's not one of us in this building this morning who are rich. We're certainly not as wealthy as this young man is. But we do carry a lot of baggage around with us. And see, his baggage, his hang-up, if you will, was money. Your hang-up might be just your dislike of other people. You know what? If somebody don't like you, move on. But don't pretend you're moving on where you still blame them on Facebook. You haven't forgiven them a bit. You've not laid that cross down. If you have jealousy in your life and someone has a four bedroom brick and you say, you know what? I wish I, had, I wish I could get away from this trailer and get a four bedroom brick just like theirs, but I want a prettier color of brick than they have. Listen, you've not laid your cross down. You can say what you do, but you have not, you have not set the things aside of this world. You know what we need to do? We sell it all. We give up career. We give up the love of others and we sell it off. Now, most of us never really get to that point, do we? You say, well, Brother Larry, do you want me to sell you yeah, my house and stuff? Well, if it's in the way of you serving God, yes. Now, if you can live there and consider it as an humble home and not be so bogged down with it, then no, keep your house and move on. But if it's a hindrance to you, yes, sell your house and move on. Your vehicles, whatever, whatever that, that, that little thing that pulls you to the ground, let it go. Let it go. And, and so we see then, that is the message he gets. One thing thou likest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Two things he says at the end, if he, and he never got that other thing done, you know that. He says, come, take up thy cross, my, take up the cross, and follow me. Three commands that most of us never do. Come. Come after Christ. Follow Him. Follow Him specifically. You know what? You follow the life of Christ. It was not a pleasant journey. He was rejected of His own people. He was beaten and scorned and made fun of. He's saying, you follow me that way. You go down the same path that I will. Follow me. Come, follow me. And that was always his command to his people. 
He come take up thy cross and follow me. Now, I don't know what your cross is, but I can tell you my cross is to preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anything that interferes with that is one of these problems. The riches of this world, if it's career, it can be something as simple as an automobile and you've got to get rid of it. And I mean literally get rid of it. Set it aside. Say, this thing is a hindrance to me. I'm not serving the Lord because of it. Then you set it aside. You said, oh, Brother Larry, I've come to the house of God. Listen, just because you come to the house of God does not mean you're plugged in. And listen, after... Three years of teaching and 22 years of preaching, I can tell when someone's plugged in and I can tell when they're unplugged too. You say, well, you're judging. No, if you're on this side of the pulpit, you learn it quick. And you know what? I know I don't either. So I'm not judging. But there's folks that come in, they're not plugged in. The monitor is somewhere else. And you won't grow that way. You may, you may show up but you know what I have found? I've gone into churches and found 70-year-old spiritual babies that attend, attended there for 60 years. And you know why they remain that way? They never were plugged in. <coughs> they showed up. They did their thing. But they weren't. And usually those individuals also have some kind of little something that they've never given up. Nor do they intend to give up. And so we find that there are a great deal of individuals still like that today. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, uh, uh, a little further back. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. The Bible says, and straightway, I'm sorry, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now the individuals that he's talking about there is Simon uh, Peter and Andrew, his brother. And, and the Lord Jesus calls to them and says, Follow me, and I will take, make you fishers of men. Now, they did just that. Now, let me say this, and we'll read of the next group that he calls, two more brothers. <coughs> they didn't leave it behind. <coughs> Peter did not leave it behind. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know three year, three and a half years later, he said, I go fishing. And you know what? He still had his boat because they were out in it. He didn't let it go. You know what? This world will bog you down. And again, I'm not talking about things this morning. I'm talking about your little hang-ups. You know what? We don't have to have fun all. In fact, we're, we're taught to be sober-minded. Now, am I telling you to go around and whoo, whoo, whoo all the time? No. But you know what? You come down to this house of God, you better be plugged in. And if you're not, you say, well, that's my business. No, it's not. Because when you're not plugged in, you draw me down too. And then, you know, uh, my mom always said, Larry, as far as you can go is home. Right? And she meant, and so once you're home, then it's my territory. You know what? And I'm not saying this is called because I'm the pastor. It's your, this is your territory too. And if somebody's dragging you down, they, we, need, we need to address the problem. We're not here to have a good time. We're here to worship the almighty God of all the universe. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And so we see then, we, uh, as the Lord's people, sometimes so we, uh, get in the same bogged up condition. So he calls Peter, but in that sense, Peter does not fall away, uh, does not follow through. Verse 21, and going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, he would be the first to die, uh, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now, we see these two individuals do something a little bit deep, different. I think in the Gospel of Luke, they actually say that, um, they, that the Scripture alludes to the fact 
that uh, Mark and James actually, uh, uh, I mean, and left them with somebody to take care of their father. Left them in the hand of someone else. And then I want you to see, it does specifically say, and left their father. You know what? That's a very hard thing to do. Me and my father were not close until the end. And then we were never as close as I am to my mother. But could you imagine saying, you know what? You're not living for the Lord. You're not interested in the things of God. I'm out of here. That's what he was asking. Most of us would never do it. And let me say this concerning Peter. And I'm the, I don't know about Peter's family life. But I do know this. He, they went back to his home. And the Lord healed his mother-in-law. So, again, I think there were some times that Peter had not given up the world. I think that was his, his, uh, his biggest hang-up. Verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. They followed him. They went through. Now, in Gospel of John, chapter 12. I'm going to go over there, back over there just for a minute. If you ever want to see Jesus lifted up as, Christ, as, the, as God, as the King of Kings, read the Gospel of John. It always honors Him in that way. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, uh, in verse uh, 6, the Bible says, And He said, not that He cared for the poor, speaking of Judas Iscariot, and He said, uh, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag that bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying have she kept this. For the poor, poor always you have with you, but you have not, but me you have not always. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, we know the Bible says concerning Judas, I think it's the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, that he was a devil from the beginning. He was, he was called of Christ, but Christ knew what he was. Then I also want you to see that it said that he was a thief. He carried the bag, and he, he was pulling his portion out, getting his little, keeping himself going. And we know that to be a true, and it was his besetting sin. And every one of us have a besetting sin. Because what did he do to the Lord Jesus Christ? He sold him out for money. 30 pieces of silver. And, that, that, and you know what? Your besetting sin may be something as small, or we see it as small, as self-righteousness. Don't let that beset you. Don't, don't let that consume your life. Because what I have found, when I let that little, little opportunity get in there, then I began to think that I'm better than everyone. And then I have to remind myself that the Scriptures say, there is none righteous, no, not one. And, and so we see that in this sin, in this text, we saw that Judas, uh, Judas wasn't the real deal. He had not given up everything. He was still a thief even after this. Way back in the book of Genesis, we read the character of another individual. Uh, Abraham's wife, Rachel. The one he loved oh so much. And the one that was the devil. You be careful what you want in the flesh. You know what never ceases to amaze me? He worked for her for 14 years. That means to me, you know what? You can put in a lot of effort and time into nothing more than the carnal desires of this flesh. He, she was a worldling. Everybody wants to give Rachel the accolades. Rachel always held on to her father's God. She never gave them up. And that's why she dropped. She, you know what? She died back on the road back to the homeland because she didn't deserve to be there. 
Did you ever think about that? She, she didn't have any interest in the things of God. And it says concerning Leah that she was a little homely. She wasn't the most pretty. Rachel had her up on looks. But you know what? Leah had a, had a desire to serve God. Leah made it down back to the homeland. Leah had an interest even in pleasing her husband. Do you know what? That was never said concerning Rachel. In fact, all it does is say she was jealous of Leah. She was a rebel. And, and, and so we see then that, that as they're making this journey back home, that, that she didn't intend to give anything up that she was accustomed to. Genesis 31, verse 31. Genesis 31, uh, verse 31. The Bible says, And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid. He had asked him, Why would you leave in the middle of the night? For I said, peradventure, that thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. Now the reason, listen, uh, Jacob had some genuine, some genuine concerns there. It was a genuine threat. It could have happened. He knew his father-in-law all too well. And, and with whomsoever thou findest thy, thy gods, let him not live. Now, you remember the accusation. He says, I've seen some of my little golden trinket gods taken. And, and he says, I know they're in your stuff somewhere. And, and you know what? This was the sad part. Jacob was so confident in his family. He said, just wherever you find them, kill that person. And he never dreamed it was Rachel. You know what? It'd always be the one you least suspect. It was Rachel. And had, had Jacob known that, he wouldn't have said it. You know why? Because he was a protector of Rachel. But you know what? He made a promise. And it happened. She died before they got there. She died before they got there. When uh, Benjamin was born. And even in the birth of Benjamin, she shows herself her selfish, hateful nature. And says, you call him grief. You call him, you call him dead. That's what Benoni means is grief. And, and you know what? Uh, Jacob wasn't uh, answering. He said, I'll call him Benjamin, meaning the son of my old age or the joy of my old age. See, she was a very, very self-centered woman and always wanted things the way that she wanted them. Now continue on reading me with verse 32. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren, discern that discern thou what is thine with me. Take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then he went into Leah. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images. And put them in the camel's furniture and set upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And he said to her, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the image. The images. Now, two things there. She was always looking for an excuse. Now, I don't know when she would say the way of women was upon me. I personally think she was referring to her pregnancy. Because it wouldn't be very long before Benjamin was born. Right. But you know what? Right. All that was is a worldly, carnal excuse. And she knew it. She knew they were there. She never gave them up. Nor did she ever intend to give them up. That, that, that was her nature. That's who she was. And so we find then, as, as her life draws to an end, that she didn't want the gods of... She didn't want the great God of, uh, of all the world. She, her cross was these little gods. Her cross was the falsehood that they took with. Her cross was idolatry. And you know, very frequently we pick up our trinkets and carry them around with us too. We won't let them go. 
that's all too important. And more often than not, they come in little things we can't see, like bitterness, hate, and strife. And we don't intend to give them up. You know what? Because she's wrong and I'm right. She's never said, I'm sorry. So what? Forgive them anyway. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches, is, is it not? Is it, is it not so? And so we find then that when we have a cross, when we're singly focused on Christ, let me show you what happens in one single verse and we'll close. In the book of Acts. Now, the church at Jerusalem had been set on fire by the work of the Holy Ghost. They, they were centered on doing what Christ had left them to do. Peter that had always denied. Peter that had never given up his fishing boat. Peter that had never let his career go by at any moment. That very same Peter. Now he serves God in a wonderful way. And you know why? He finally let it go. He finally turned it loose. He finally let down his cross of fishing. And he picked up his cro God's cross of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he became the pastor of First Baptist Jerusalem, the very first pastor after the Lord Jesus Christ, and he did that to the day that he died. That's what he was willing to do. And this morning, that is what we as the Lord's people should always do with singleness of heart. Look with me in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. Acts chapter 2, and, well, let's read verse 45 with it as well. Acts chapter 2, verse 45. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. You know what? They did exactly what the Lord asked of that rich young ruler, did they not? That, you know what? In other words, I could sell my house. You know, have you ever thought about really? And you know, I don't know if we would eat, you know, a minimal diet like we like we should instead of uh, pigging out on, on chocolate cake all the time. But just really what we need. And me and Donna sold our house and say we got $150,000 for it. How long could we feed this church? I would be willing to say if we would eat reasonably... We could probably feed this number of people for five years. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Give it up. Let it go. And that's what, that's what we as the Lord's people did. And uh, need to do. And they had the singleness of mind to do this. And they did not worry about earthly treasures. They were not concerned about the results. They just followed through. And they sold their possession and goods. And parted to all the men as every man had need. And they continually, daily, with one accord in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They had given it up. They had laid this world down and they pick up the world to come. See, we, we need to do that. We need to get off the little uh, trinkets and stuff that we hide. The little uh, grudges that we hold. Really, that's the biggest trinket that I know among God's people today is grudges. And you will never be pleasing to the Lord until you look it away and say, I'm done. It doesn't matter what the other person does or says or has done. What you need to be focused on is the benefit of self. So I ask you, are you the rich one, young ruler? Or has the Lord finally brought you to the point of Peter? And Pe you know, think about it. It took Peter three and a half years to finally get it. Really, if you take it carefully and look at it, three and a half years and 40 days to finally say, oh, now I know what he was talking about. Remember what the Lord said concerning Peter. He says, Peter, I pray for thee. 
that uh, uh, I pray for thy strength, for the devil has desired to sift you like wheat. But when ye are converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, he wasn't talking about being saved, because he was saved in Matthew 16, right? But he was talking about Peter had some hang-ups. And he says, Peter, get rid of them. And when you do get rid of them, strengthen the brethren. How did he strengthen them? He was their pastor. He followed through what he said. So whatever our problems are, for each other's benefit, we should give them up. For each other, each other's help, uh, we we should uh, go after this with signals of heart.